I hope this is Akshra Menon from PMS Bazaar. Welcome you all to the webinar of the day on the topic Current Aim Strategy, Seizing Opportunities Across uh, Sectors and Market Cap. Ideally, this will be our last webinar for this current fiscal year. Happy to have it at Nifty at its all-time new heights. The current fiscal year has been a tremendously good for the market, seeing at a uh, lot of new highs where small and mid-cap stocks' performance was a new surprise, which brought a lot of new players into the market. Uh, with that, we can expect a positive spin around the market with unexpected sectors performing well. Let us discuss each of them in detail in this webinar. With no delay, let me welcome the speaker of today, Mr. Nizer Shah. Mr. Nizer Shah, a distinguished financial expert, leads the uh, successful brilliant aim multi-cap strategies, renowned for its innovation and performance. As a fund manager, his experience drives consistent growth and re remarkable returns. His hands-on approach focuses on risk management and ability to identify the opportunities established uh, him as the thought leader. Uh, Mr. Shah's commitment to staying ahead in trends enhances the strategy's performance, making it a trailblazer in investment management. He integrates ethical and sustainable practices, earning accolades from the industry's peers in India. With integrity and innovation, Mr. Shah continues to shape the investment management, driving credit A multi-cap strategy to success. Moving on to the next, Mr. Vedan Patel, a, a learned professional working in areas of fundamental model, modeling and multi-factor research, portfolio risk management, and business development. He earlier had a research at Bellum Capital. He has completed his MSc in Finance, a gold medalist, and BSc in Finance from NMI University. So, with, with due respect, let me give the podium to Mr. Nicer Shah. And also, before, please kindly put your questions on the QA box and not to ask any stock specific questions. Thank you, sir. Over to you, sir. Hi, uh, thanks, Akshara, and uh, thanks, PMS Bajar, for this opportunity. Uh, we will take you to the presentation first. So, uh, topic of the day is, uh, you know, seizing opportunities across sectors and market caps. So, first we'll start with a quick update on macro. Uh, you know, our twin uh, deficits, current account and fiscal deficits, which have been a problem in the past, is no, long, is no longer a problem and is well under control. Current account deficit, let's say, about 1% of GDP and next year fiscal deficit, uh, government is targeting about 5.2% of GDP. So, Fiscal consolidation has happened. Uh, so macro on that front looks good. And if you see, India is one of the fastest growing economies in the world today with FY GDP growth rate close to 8%, the data that we have seen. So, you know, uh, and uh, next, year, next year in the medium term looks good with uh, about 7% kind of GDP growth going ahead. Government policies, uh, you know, have been supportive of growth. We have seen the current government for last 10 years and, you know, the policy continuation always helps in terms of corporates planning their, uh, you know, business strategies and uh, you know so that we have seen good growth government policies also been supportive and if you see the gdp composition is not just dependent on one factor now all engines of the economy whether consumption investment exports they all have been doing well so it's just no longer dependent on one factor and if you see india's market share in goods and services exports of course our market share is higher in services than in uh, goods uh, manufacturing but overall, we are still, uh, you know, uh, we very low market share and with China plus one, uh, you know, sentiment prevailing, we expect this uh, market share to rise going forward. We have seen burn, good burns in direct and indirect tax collection over the last 10 years. And on the demographic side, you know, we have one of the uh, highest working age population in the world and the median age of, of our population is 27 years. And equities as a person percentage of household assets is just 5% in India. Uh, so that leaves plenty of room for growth versus 23% in USA and 18% in Japan. Now coming to uh, Trident Aim multi-cap strategy, you know, uh, what is our investment approach? So we have a sector agnostic portfolio uh, where we construct a portfolio of about 28 to 30 stocks across market cap, uh, across market caps. So it's Basically, uh, bottom-up stock picking the companies that we like, uh, you know, available at reasonable valuation. Then it's a uh, fundamental research back and process-driven stock selection process. So we have the entire, you know, process as to how we uh, identify companies and, you know, select investments for our portfolio. And uh, as I said, ours is a bottom-up approach. We really look for companies with uh, good visibility of earning growth and 
are trading at attractive valuations. Uh, focus is always on finding mispriced opportunities uh, in the sense where we think that uh, uh, you know there is a disconnect between price and value. Price is uh, and objective is to generate alpha for investors with a three to five year time horizon because you know that could be volatility in, in in the short near term. But of course, one can judge only uh, over a three to five year, and there are underwear of the objective is to generate good alpha with that kind of time horizon. And reasonable valuations. While we look for growth, at the same time we are very mindful of the valuations that we pay, uh, right? So it's growth at uh, reasonable uh, prices. So what we uh, look to get uh, should be more than what we pay. Uh, so that is basic broadly our investment approach, the how we construct the portfolio. So now this presentation is divided across, uh, you know, five sections. Where in the first is multi-cap portfolios for risk management and diversification. Uh, then second is mix of both growth and value. Third point is supporting emerging trends for strategic sector allocation and then diverse uh, investment landscape. So we'll just take you through this one by one. So this is a uh, composition of our portfolio. So today, uh, roughly about 22% of our uh, investment is in large cap. Mid cap is about 39% of the portfolio, small and micro cap 36% and about 3% uh, we uh, cash we have in our portfolio. And, uh, and on the right hand side, you know, it shows that EBITDA margin uh, uh, ROE of, uh, you know, small cap, mid cap and large cap companies. Uh, so it's uh, not that they are very inferior compared to the larger peers. This slide talks about risk uh, mitigation. So uh, we invest in opportunities across multiple businesses. Uh, so portfolio is not heavily concentrated in a, in a particular uh, sector or a stock. We, we have representation from various businesses in our portfolio and obviously, you know, that reduces the risk if something were to go wrong in a particular business or a particular uh, particular theme. Uh, so, so we have a diversified portfolio and our objective is to identify and spot businesses which are likely to have strong earnings growth uh, where business or the industry has tailwind going ahead. Uh, and are yet available at reasonable valuation and market is not kind of uh, priced in those growth prospects where we think that, you know, uh, we can assess the growth prospects uh, better than others and kind of not paying too much for that valuation. Uh, we have a, a, a dynamic nature of theme selection. We look at an attractive mix of uh, uh, special decisions. So while there are long term components in the portfolio. We, uh, we also look for, uh, you know, always on the lookout for special situations, be it, uh, you know, demerger or buybacks or those kind of uh, uh, opportunities which come, you know, uh, quite often in the market. So, you know, you can, one can always take advantage of such special situation. And there are always long-term compounders, uh, you know, which compounds the capital, uh, you know, at a decent rate over a, over a medium to long term. Okay. Uh, so, you know, as I said, our focus is on uh, buying undervalued stocks with uh, solid sustainable growth potential. And uh, while, you know, uh, we look for upside in the stock that we buy at the same time, we are cognizant of the risk adjusted returns. Are we not taking excessive uh, risk for the for the returns that we hope to generate? So our strategy, multi-cap strategy, you know, uh, since we, we invest across mid-cap, large-cap, small-cap, micro-cap, we have uh, the strategy as a potential for higher returns. Uh, and portfolio is a good uh, balance between growth and value investing. Uh, and... Uh, we try to mitigate the risk by not taking excessive exposure to a particular stock or the sector. And since we have a diversified portfolio across themes of sectors and uh, about 28 to 30 stocks in a portfolio, uh, we, we we mitigate the risk that way. And what would, uh, what would be the limitations? Okay, uh, so obviously valuation... Uh, uh, valuation is an art uh, and you have to assess the business prospects of the company and see the where the business is headed and as to what valuations it should trade it. So our definition of reasonable uh, price or valuation could be different uh, and there could be, uh, you know, potential for overvaluation in, in, the, in the short to medium term where we could have assessed the growth prospects uh, uh, higher than the markets and there could be volatility since portfolio has uh, decent exposure to mid and small cap stocks. By definition, small cap, micro cap stocks are very volatile. So portfolio could have, uh, you know, some impact of volatility. So these are broadly uh, the pros and cons of investing in, uh, you know, multi cap uh, strategy. Emerging trend. So this slide uh, talks about, you know, uh, the share of manufacturing in GDP. Uh, you know, uh, the share is how the share has moved from 10%, uh, you know, uh, to almost 17% now. And, uh, with PLI and government's trust on manufacturing and 
many industries and sectors looking at China plus uh, one uh, this this contribution will rise going forward. So what are the uh, you know tailwinds driving the growth in manufacturing? We have one of the lowest labor costs. Uh, government is incentivizing through PLI scheme and uh, uh, there is strong uh, you know China plus one or anti China sentiment that that really helps uh, people are looking for alternate supply chain and that is where India scores in. So uh, we we could have group, good growth in the manufacturing going going ahead on the back of these tailwinds. Yeah. So basically, as we were discussing regarding the manufacturing trends and other factors. What we basically look for under our current investment approach is the decadal opportunities, which could be long-term compounders with natural cushion of growth and tailwinds. Now, we've divided our philosophy currently into three main aspects, which are which is manufacturing, digitization, and self-sustainable India. Under manufacturing, our objective or our thesis is that in India, we manufacture for the world and also for India. So we're looking for positive opportunities in this sector, which would uh, lead to profitability growth in various companies. Next is the digitization, which is currently happening and the opportunities, various opportunities that are getting created across the board in the digitization sector. We are very much positive on that. And also the third most important point is the self self-sustainable India or make in India. So with this, there have been a plethora of opportunities in the infra, capex and energy space, which is leading to a lot of uh, cap capital, expend capital expenditure, which is taking place and giving a boost to the economy, which in turn is then represented into the performance of our stocks as well. Next, I would like to discuss how to, does the strategic sector allocation, which is a part of philosophy, help us allocate in various sectors and which in turn helps uh, create wealth for our clients? So when I talk about sector allocation, it is very much important that we understand the theme where we are deploying the funds. So we have these three directives of for deploying capital that we have defined. The first most important directive is that we should have the conviction that the theme, theme will remain strong and this should follow from our understanding of the industry and it and its tailwinds. So we should first have conviction in the theme that we are looking at. And the second point being that this conviction should be there for the long term. Short term ups and downs in the themes or short term ups and downs in the performance shouldn't lead to reducing our conviction in any theme. Our conviction should be stable and should be there for the long term. And all of this is possible only when we look at good quality businesses, which are available at reasonable valuations, so that we can compound wealth for our clients over the long-term perspective. So whenever we see these objectives getting followed in any theme, that is where we deploy the capital or that is the sector that we choose for. Now, deploying capital in var during various themes and various sectors, it is very much different in different phases of the market. So there are different phases that we've list listed down here which probably would be inflation. In inflation, there would be different kinds of sectors or themes that would play. Similarly with deflation, it would be completely different. During bull markets, obviously the more momentum-based themes or other themes would play, uh, play a more progressive path. Whereas in, the bear, in a bear market, defensive themes would play a major role and we might have allocations in those. So dynamically leading to the acceleration or deceleration in the economies, a growth phase or a recession phase, or a greed phase or a fear phase. So there are different phases in the markets and the economy of a country in terms of growth rates and sentiments. So according to that, we need to strategically decide our sector allocations and accordingly obviously also evolve with the sector allocations to have the best composite sectors in a portfolio. So when we are speaking about strategic sector allocation, it is very well represented into our top five holdings as well. So these are the top five holdings in our portfolios. We start with Motila Loswal, which is from the BFSI space. Then we have HBL Power and Mac Power, which is from the manufacturing space. Then we also have a company, Godrej Properties, from the real estate space, and also Kowei Medico, which is from the medical space. So this shows how diverse we are in terms of sector allocation and theme allocation, because we don't want to over concentrate our portfolio towards just one theme. Hence, we are allocated across manufacturing, real estate healthcare and also BFSI. So this very well represents our strategic sector allocation strategy. Next, I would like to speak about the diverse investment landscape that we have, 
which gives us this flexibility of allocating funds across the board and also taking advantage of various different and new age opportunities which are coming up. So when I talk about diverse investment landscape, obviously the landscape becomes large, but then our process or our investing style shouldn't differ. So our main objective is that we follow a disciplined approach wherein we might take exposure to various themes, wherein some themes would take would be long term in nature and would take some time to create value, whereas some would realize value in a short term. So we have to be adaptable with respect to the time horizons as well and also the uh, themes to the extent to which we wish to diversify. And along with that, the weightages and entry points of the themes which also change over time, depending on the attractiveness of a theme. Now, all of this is possible in a diverse investment landscape only when we follow the complete process, right process of investing, which in involves proper research of the business and industry, which would help, up, help us identify the key drivers. The analysis of the all kinds of analysis of this key, driver, key drivers is very much in, important, which includes qualitative aspects, quantitative aspects, our toolkit checklists, then classification, well classification of stocks and finding worthy companies out of them. Once we found the found good companies out of them, the decision making and monitoring are even more important factors. Wherein we should our objective should be to enter at the right time and with the right amount of weightage in order to manage the risk as well in the portfolio and also avoid over diversification. So decision and monitoring go line in line. Even post you've taken the investment decision, constant monitoring of the key drivers is very much important. And we follow that as a very much disciplined approach so that we have an unbiased way and a process driven investing approach. When I talk about diverse investment landscape, there are various advantages of that which we also take in our multi-cap strategy, wherein we have exposure to different market segments, which help us mitigate various sector specific risks because it is well divided. We are able to adapt to various market conditions and also have lower volatility. So a diverse thematic, a diverse approach helps us in uh, having lower volatility in the portfolio. And in terms of sector, we have exposure to capital growth opportunities, sector rotation opportunities, enhanced the portfolio has enhanced resilience during downturns. And we also take advantage of special situations which help create returns for clients which have a very favorable risk reward. So when I talk about special situations, we, we, we also optimistically look for opportunities which include corporate restructuring, companies who are going through temporary issues leading to significant valuation cushion, or some policy change or government change which would bring about, bring about a significant change in the company. So mix of all of this is something that helps us construct our complete portfolio. This is just a funnel approach that we follow. So once we have our universe, diverse universe of stocks, there is research or pointers which are well defined for every sector when we follow our research process, which monitor the growth drivers, the business drivers, checks the quality of the business and its sustainable competitive advantage. We correlate its profits and the cash flows because cash having healthy cash flows is very much important for a long-term growth journey. And then we get to our composite list, which which then make a portfolio of 28 to 30 stocks under our approach, which is which have a diverse investment landscape, a multi-cap approach with less risk and divided sector allocation. So this was more about it. Now I'd like to speak a bit about our team as to how do we manage and who heads the position. So Mr. Nicer Shah and Mr. Madhusudan Sarda, they are the two fund managers for this multi-cap strategy. Both individually have more than 22 plus years of experience. Mr. Nasser Shah is a CA CFA and has, uh, was earlier part of Birla Sun Life, where he man managed two thematic funds for a four-year horizon, where he managed a tune of 2,500 crores in total. And he tracked large number of companies across sectors and market, market caps in his previous experiences. Next fund manager is Mr. Madhusudan Sada, who again has more than two decades of experience in the public markets, with his focus on micro, small, and mid-cap stock picking. Earlier, Mr. Madhusudan Sada was also the founder at Val, co-founder at Valum Capital, where he was part of the team and uh, part of the Valum PMS from 2010 to 2022, 
where his AU uh, during his tenure AUM grew from zero to thousand crores in that twelve year journey. In total, our research team has hundred plus years of experience. I am part of the research team and also handle few business development aspects. And we have Mr. Shreyas Shah, who is the head of research and is also a CSCFA with twenty one plus of year, years of experience. In our investment committee, Mr. Viral Javeri also adds a, new, a pivotal role. With 20 plus, 24 plus years of market experience, he acts as an advisor for our decision making. So this composite con construct of research-oriented approach of investing helps us generate returns, which have been presented in this graph. So we started this strategy earlier in March, so March 2023. And BSE 500 being our benchmark, we've been successfully able to beat our benchmark in the long term and as well in the, uh, the six-month horizon. In the in the three or one month horizon, obviously markets have been volatile, volatile. So obviously we haven't beaten the benchmark. But then we don't we think that that's a very short duration to monitor performance. Even one year is a very short duration, we would say, because we look at anyone or clients who can join us with a long term perspective of three to five years and nothing below that, because that much time we think is required for any business to project its performance and the same to reflect in the share price. So this was more about our strategy and how we think about our philosophy of investing. Yeah. Thank you, Vedant. Uh, so that the uh, PPT was very short a strip. So let's, before uh, moving on to the questions, let me give the first reference to the audience questions. So this plethora of questions are flowing out of the podium. And uh, probably I could ask this to Nizer, sir because of your experience, you know, uh, what do you think would be the biggest mistakes in your career or any less, the learned lessons from your career or in your fund? So the biggest learning is, uh, you know, for a particular any particular company, market looks for, you know, growth catalyst or triggers. Uh, market always rewards growth in a in a market like India, you know, uh, India is a growing market. So come, people, investors always look for growth, right? So when, uh, when when you think the company will probably not deliver earnings, let's say for next three years, then then the derating happens. So uh, so you could be slightly uh, ahead in terms of uh, you know actual growth coming in based on your business understanding. But uh, you know if the company is likely to have uh, lackluster earnings growth, let's say for you know uh, two two three years, that is when then that is when the stock derating happens. And you know uh, yeah, and then maybe if you are, if you are holding that stock for then you see could see good time and price correction uh, in such stocks. Basically, basically, you growth, you uh, you know, growth uh, investing or basically the companies with higher growth characteristic market rewards those kind of so it would be very cognizant of you know uh, or the mindful of the actual uh, growth coming in. You know, the company likely to deliver those kind of earning earning growth. So my next question from Arjun Patel was that uh, he has a couple of questions to ask. So first, very first was like, what is your current AUM of uh, multi cap strategy? Do you want to reveal it? Uh, current multi-cap strategy is divided into few advisory commitments and few uh, direct PMS commitments. So cumulatively, the AUM there is constructs around 135 to 140 crores. Okay. And the next question will be like, how many unique investors are there in your business? Unique investors would be around 40. Okay. The next following question, uh, what is the amount, uh, amount fund manager has invested in your PMS? Amount of fund managers has, has invested in That your would be around 30% of the AUM. AUA. And last question from Arjun Patel was like, what is the amount of trustees example that is, uh, has invested in your PMS? What do you mean? So trustees basically, this is not an AI structure. So there are no trustees in an AI structure. So I don't think uh, there would be any trustee. There's no trustee in a PMS strategy. There are the fund managers or the asset management company. So moving on to the market question, that, that uh, with the uh, uh, Fed retaining its uh, guidance for three rate cuts in 2024, what does it mean to make markets like India, emerging markets like India? So, uh, you know, maybe Fed uh, expected to cut in, uh, interest rates three times in, uh, you know, uh, January 24. Basically, it gives uh, a room for RBI to cut interest rates because, you know, uh, there is a spread between uh, US and uh, yeah, India interest rates and inflation in India well under control. If with Fed cutting three times, likely cutting interest rates three times, that gives more uh, headroom for RBI to maybe start uh, cutting interest rates from third quarter onwards. So that will bring down that will bring down the uh, you know interest rates in India, uh, maybe starting third quarter of FY twenty five, and you know that will give uh, good respite on the borrowing cost side. 
uh, of course, it will be unfair if I don't ask this question. How does this uh, next financial uh, looking out for India? So, in terms of uh, earnings. So Okay, so if you look at uh, FI24, uh, you know, nine months uh, numbers are already out and we will, Nifty will have about 20% kind of earnings growth in FI24. Now, on, on a large base of FI24, next year earnings growth would be around 13 to 14%. And uh, based on that, Nifty trades at roughly about 20 times FI25 earnings. So, very strong earnings growth 24, 13 to 14% kind of earnings growth 25. And on that, your Nifty, on a headline, Nifty trades at about roughly about 20 times FI25 earnings. So the next market, uh, you know, the we talk was like about elections. So in that run-up of elections, what investment strategy would you recommend to the investors? To be honest, I mean, investment uh, strategy, I mean, one should not just build investment strategy based on elections, right? Because, you know, we'll have elections every five, five years, whereas you are building equity uh, portfolio for a longer term, right? Uh, so, so one should just stay invested. You know, there could be volatility around elections, but you cannot time entry and exit. So if you have constructed portfolio of good quality companies, just stay invested. You know, maybe there could be volatility, take volatility in your stride. And then, you know, a market compounds or equity portfolio compounds at decent rate over medium to long term. Because otherwise you can't just, I mean, construct portfolio based on elections uh, outcomes and all that. So one should have the stat, uh, strategy or portfolio of buying good quality stocks and hold it for a medium to long term and uh, accept volatility as part of that process. And uh, like uh, one question from the podium was like, uh, okay, uh, please give some examples of spe uh, special situation invested by you. If, if there's any, if you could give an example. So, Vedan, can we give a specific example? Yeah, we can give uh, with the disclaimer that it's not a stock advice and these yeah, are okay. things we had done in the past. Uh, so, okay, so one sector, example. Sector would do. If it is a sector. Yeah, or maybe I'll, I'll give the uh, stock name. Uh, so we have invested in IDFC. Now that company owns roughly about 37% of IDFC First Bank. And, uh, you know, board has uh, uh, approved the merger. So shareholders of IDFC will get shareholders of IDFC First Bank. Now, based on the prevailing prices today, uh, you know, a stock of IDFC is available at 10% discount. And we are very bullish on prospects of even IDFC First Bank. Uh, you know, very narrow way will uh, you know expand from 1.1 percent currently to 1.5 percent in medium term. And so, so by, by buying IDFC, you are in a way uh, taking a call on IDFC. And where, as I said, because of the merger timing, uh, you know, because there's some time involved before the merger gets consummated, there is a, this 10 percent discount. So that's one of the examples of uh, special situation investing. But that I think the question is answered. Moving on to the next question from Jay Mehta was like, uh, like you mentioned in your presentation, that the objective is to generate alpha over three to five year horizon. Even mutual funds will do uh, in this three horizon that you have mentioned. So why would they opt for your PMS? So basically, under a PMS, how we differ from mutual fund is firstly the number of stocks that we have. So mutual funds generally tend to have fifty stocks. Small cap mutual funds have more than hundred stocks as well. Whereas under our approach, we have around 20 to 30 stocks. So we aren't over diversified, we are reasonably diversified. So with this kind of, of approach, it helps us generate that extra alpha, which is over and above the benchmark. And at times, uh, our objective also is to beat the mutual funds. So the diversification perspective is very much important that you get an advantage under a PMS strategy. And you get to also, uh, considering the size that we currently have, we also get the opportunity to allocate to smaller names, which would be probably some micro cap stocks, which won't be possible under any mutual fund scheme. So the complete compounding journey of a stock from becoming a micro cap to small cap, small cap to mid cap, that can be done if some if a, uh, a client is part of our PMS strategy. So that is an added advantage that we give. And when you talk on the market cap, small cap stocks have been under pressure in the previous month, uh, in the month of February, uh, which has reflected the, um, of course, the monthly returns. So, so what do you expect the uh, uh, trend to continue or do you, where do you see the valuations? So, you know, CY23 was a very good year for small cap indexes. The index itself had gone up more than 50%, right? So one cannot expect similar returns, you know, every year. And equity is never a... Uh, you know, one way journey where every year, every year the market just goes up, right? Then there could be periods of correction, market consolidates. And then, of course, there was growth in the market, right? Because we could see, you know, uh, valuations reaching a crazy level, you know, those broad participation, those there were large inflows in small cap schemes and CB had to intervene. So we could see, you know, people 
just chasing small cap stocks because small cap index had done very well in CY23. It's always like that, you know, people chase the ones, the index of the theme that had a good performance in the recent past, right? So on the back of that, we saw a correction in March. Now market kind of consolidating and uh, and now depending on the companies that you have invested in based on the earning growth valuation and you know the growth process of the company, uh, stocks will do well. But there could be periods of con uh, correction like the one that we are seeing right now. There will be periods of consolidation and then eventually you know uh, stocks will resume uh, uh, you know fundamentally good companies they will resume their journey and that's how you compound wealth over a medium to long term. It's never a one way journey you know. There will be all. There will always be periods like this. If there is excessive growth or you know euphoria, then you will see correction and then consolidation and then again you know uh, the upward trajectory. So these are you know natural movements uh, in in equity markets. Yeah, of course. But when you say about the downturn and in that in medium or long term perspective, do you think you need to become a bit conservative in the segment right now? So. Uh, it just depends on you know one's uh, equity uh, allocation and how much they've invested in mid cap, large cap. First of equities as a percentage of their savings or equities uh, based on their uh, you know uh, what stage of the life cycle they are in or the equity uh, asset allocation all that. So equity uh, it's a function of a lot of factors and then based on your risk appetite, uh, risk appetite you decide how much allocation you want to have to a particular theme. But of course small small cap space being more volatile uh, you know than large caps. Uh, you you will see that kind of volatility, but of course, uh, you know, you, maybe you can generate a very good returns over a longer term. But you have to go through that volatility. So it's it's individuals' comfort and individuals' choice as to you know what they want to, uh, what kind of exposure they want to have. There is no one universal answer. Of course, when you talk about volatility, you know, last month because of uh, uh, the market small mid cap uh, underperforming. Uh, we had a lot of uh, uh, fund houses exiting uh, those uh, exiting the fund uh, fund. I mean, sitting on cash flow comparatively. So and your cash still maintained at five percent as I said in PPT. So how do you see that? So uh, in our multi cap strategy, as we, as you said, you know, we invest across mid cap, large cap, and small cap, micro cap. So ours is more as as as, as we have discussed that more, more of a bottom up approach. So wherever we find that. You know, this company offers or this stock offers good earnings, visibility, and available at attractive valuation. Then we don't try to time. We don't try to see that. You know, I we don't want to take a kind of call that whether next month market will correct. You know, how much it will correct. It's very nobody can time it to that perfection. So our job is to identify good companies and buy at reasonable valuations. What market does tomorrow day after not in our control. And our job is just to identify good companies and stay invested. Uh, you know, based on our conviction and thesis. Uh, very difficult to time and one should not try to do that more or day after or a month. You just uh, build in conservatism in your uh, estimates, valuations, and then construct the portfolio. But uh, you know, you can't just uh, take a call on market movements in short term. Uh, short term. Yeah, true. After this uh, mid cap, small cap, ka hala ball thing, uh, SB, uh, uh, SEBI has uh, now uh, asked for MF to stop accepting the inflows in the ETFs investing in overseas. Do you think it's an alarming uh, sound or investors should worry about it? You're asking about overseas? Uh, ETFs investing in overseas as a restriction for, by SEBI in mutual funds. Do you think, and after this uh, mid-cap, small-cap valuations, even this has also been talk of the town, talk of the market to be very honest. So do you think investors should be, uh, should worry about this? I mean, as we discussed, it depends on how much allocation you have to equities, right? Uh, in, in India, in any case, you know, people people have under allocation to equities as an asset class, right? So, so I mean, so such things will happen, but you just, uh, you know, maybe stay invested in quality companies or PMS or whatever, right? And then take volatility and, but over a longer period, you've seen, you know, Indian market has compounded at a decent rate, uh, right? Uh, so you do accept such phases. If you if you want higher returns as we expect, right, from equity as an asset class, then you know such uh, volatility is part and parcel of the process. And uh, when you when you spoke about your uh, top five allocations uh, in your portfolio, you had given a major chunk for the manufacturing sector as well. Do you think the next multi bag would be from the manufacturing sector because the make in India uh, pushed by the government? So, you know, multi-bagger could be from various sectors, right? You've seen data from the past that multi-baggers could be from different sectors. So, and it's a very difficult to call out in the beginning that this stock, this stock will turn out to be multi-bagger. Our job is to identify good companies uh, run by good management, uh, good 
business prospects, cash flow, balance sheet, available at attractive valuations and stay invested in the company as long as the thesis is playing out, right? Uh, whether the stock is a multi-bagger or not is an outcome, right? That we'll only know in future and with the benefit of hindsight, we can say that this turned out to be multi-bagger. So I would say that, you know, rather than concentrating uh, on a world multi-bagger or trying to find a multi-bagger, you have a portfolio of good quality stocks and look at portfolio returns rather than just maybe get excited with one or two stocks turning out to be multi-bagger from your portfolio. Just look at portfolio returns over a, over a medium to long term. And if you're compounded at a decent rate, you will, you will create good wealth in medium to long term, right? That should be the objective rather than just trying to focus on one or two stocks, you know, which, which turns out to be multi-bagger. Focus should be on portfolio returns on an aggregate basis. When you talk on sector as a whole, uh, PSU units have done tremendously well. In that, you know, PSU banks have contributed much more. Um, so, where do you see the scope, earnings, and price appreciation in that uh, PSE unit? And do you have any allocation in your portfolio? So, you know, we prefer uh, private sector banks over PSU banks. So, we have uh, uh, large cap private sector banks, we have mid cap, uh, small cap private sector banks, and we have selective lenders, right? So, our tilt is more towards uh, private sector companies in this sector where we, uh, you know, where we find valuations to be uh, relatively more attractive. And so our portfolio is more exposed to those names or those those teams within banking space. Uh, so Tubeta, I just want to ask, what is the, you know, what is the color of the market through your eyes? And uh, what are you looking to buy in recent times? If you could mention like top five stocks or top five sectors of that in your radar. Vela, yes. Yeah. So the top five sectors is something which we already presented. But if we see that, then it is spread across some allocation in the banking and financial space. It is then followed by some allocation in the services space as well. And most important being there's allocation on the manufacturing side and companies who are going to benefit from the infra and capex spend in the country. Uh, so, so, of yeah. course, uh, thank you. But your AIM strategy has completed one year. Yes. Um, how do you compare your strategy with other multi-cap strategies in the market? To be very frank, the last one year has been favorable in for the markets and for all PMS houses as well. Our agenda or objective majorly is not to compare with any other fund house, but rather it is to follow our investment approach and philosophy in a disciplined manner and a process driven have a process driven approach. So we are more focused towards that rather than comparing it with other names because everyone has their own philosophy, own stock picking styles. Our objective is to follow our style in a very disciplined manner and have an unbiased way of investing. So that's what we look for. And when you talk on uh, sector-based. And, and to beat the benchmark, uh, you know, with a reasonable, uh, with a reasonable margin and generate alpha over a three to five year period. So we, what we can do is what is in our control, right? Just focus on processes uh, and construct the portfolio and then, you know, outcome will be known only in future. Yeah, true. Uh, when you talk, when, when they were talking about the sector uh, allocation part of it, uh, you know, there will, uh, PSU sector, which was not into the radar for the past few years have come into the radar. So do you think any other sector which is, come, which is undervalued today will be, you know, you know, uh, it will be into the radar for the next financial year? Difficult to say in the next just one year, but uh, probably we see that in the next three, three years, the some sectors, on, uh, some companies on the services side are on the undervaluation range and there are quite a lot of improvements that are happening. So we could see a good uptake on the services space in the next three years. But difficult to comment comment for a twelve month period. Okay, uh, because you, uh, our aim strategy has completed its one year. So, what was the difference in the portfolio if an investor would have invested one year back, and if, uh, if a new investor comes to you now? So, what are the difference in the portfolio? So, firstly, there is a lot of differentiation on the allocation style that we all know the market cycle. A portfolio which was formed one year ago was probably the complete portfolio constructed was constructed within a 10 days time horizon. Whereas now, considering the current market valuations, we are conscious on our, uh, on our allocation. And it is not that we deploy the full capital within just 10 days or within a week's time. We take at around a once, one month's time to do the complete deployment and at times of some time more than that as well. So 50% portfolio is allocated on day one. And rest is allocated slowly over a period of time. But in the last one week or 10 days when the market has fallen, obviously, we've increased our value allocation and we do 60 to 70% allocation as that of today. My next question, that was my next question was that um, about the risk management. Because, of course, it's unfair to, you know, 
time the market. It is not possible. So how how uh, you know strong is your risk management? So our object, so as you rightly said, it is uh, very much difficult to time the markets. So uh, we try to manage risk not by timing the market, but rather having a diversified approach wherein we invest across themes and businesses, which are uncorrelated, so that the impact, if any theme gets impacted, the complete portfolio shouldn't get impacted with that. So a di well, well diversified portfolio across sectors and themes and across market caps help us mitigate risk. And what are the queries that you get from the clients, especially when Nifty at his all-time high? Um, so to be very frank, we don't get much queries related to the Nifty because whoever gets associated with us on day one or rather before being associated, we are very much clear that we have a multi-cap approach with around 70% allocation to micro, mid and small caps, which is very much different from the construct of a Nifty 50 index. So it is not a comparable for us. And uh, one shouldn't exactly compare to Nifty 50 because that's a construct of 50 stocks, which are large cap stocks. So markets would have its cycles and sometimes Nifty would do well, sometimes we would do well. In the last one year, if you see, in a one year horizon, obviously we've done pretty well than Nifty and across other mark other indexes as well. But Nifty won't be the right comparable for us. No, my intent of passing the question was not that, but rather it was like, you know, when markets are at all time, the fear between investors would be like, uh, is it the right time to invest or should uh, should they wait for the dip? You know, these are the two questions which uh, uh, comes in often. So is, did you come across such questions through your clients? Or Right. We definitely come across such questions from the clients. But what happens is that when we are thinking for a long term, let's say a three to five year horizon, then these short-term volatilities or these movements should be taken advantage of. So obviously, two, 15 days, 20 days ago, markets were at highs, but somebody who would have started then and post that, the market has fallen. So we've taken advantage of such volatile times and allocated the funds. So what one should do, do is that the, yeah. uh, the objective is to stay invested in the equity markets and earn a compound wealth in the long term. So one should look at it from that perspective. And markets being high and low, obviously there would be ups and downs. And our approach that we have, which is a stock-specific approach. So the bottom-up approach helps us only select opportunities which have good growth prospects ahead and currently which are available at comfortable valuations. So when we are entering at comfortable valuations, we are very much comfortable allocating in such time, uh, such market scenarios as well. Uh, so I, we are coming to the end of uh, financial Europe. Uh, so and we, are, we are entering a new financial year, to be very honest. Uh, so what are the key learnings that uh, you would want to take it forward? Necessary if you can take this question. So you're saying what are the key learnings? Yes. Learnings in the sense, uh, the same the process that we follow, have diversified portfolio, markets will be volatile, uh, stocks will go through, you know, the kind of euphoric that we saw in January, February, and then sharp correction in small cap, mid cap in March. But you stick to your process, uh, invest with a medium to long term view. Uh, don't get carried away, invest in good companies with minimum three to five years kind of horizon because you know equity is not linear or one way kind of state, right? It will taste your patience. Sometimes you could be early in a theme, but as long as if company does well, eventually stock will does uh, stock will do well. But difficult to uh, try, uh, time and say precisely this is what my stock will do over the next one year. You give at least three to five years for a portfolio as a whole. And then one can compound at a decent rate. Don't try to time the market and don't try to uh, get into trying to predict what is going to happen tomorrow or day after. Just follow the process driven approach, stick to good stick with good companies in, uh, with, in, and invest with a medium to long term. You know, so those are those are I, I will say, you know, learnings which which would remain forever. So what is the one trigger that you want to say, you know, give an uh, give us an uh, advice to the new investors who's going to step forward? So, I mean, new investors, because say equity, equity uh, does well over a longer period, if you see history, right, 20, 25 years, but equities are by nature very volatile, right? So one should know uh, their risk appetite, asset allocation, and, you know, having once invested in equities, don't expect, uh, you know, uh, quick returns in short term. You could get, if you are lucky, you know, if one would have invested, say, last year between March. December, you know, markets give good returns in short, uh, uh, short time. But, you know, don't expect with those kind of uh, expectations, don't invest with those kind of expectations, give reasonable time period for equities to compound 
you know over a longer period and then you know if you've invested with let's say you know 15 20 years and then you compound at decent rate that's when you see the difference between in investing in equities as an asset class and other uh, other asset classes so to give reasonable time period but of course you have to take volatility uh, except volatility is a part of the process and don't expect one way linear returns corrections will uh, our we have seen two kind of correction past corrections will happen again but just stay invested have faith in equities as an asset class for medium to long term wealth creation yeah we'll talk about alloc- asset allocation apart from equity even gold as an asset has done immensely well in previous year so do you think uh, is uh, what is your take on do you think investors should have a well diversified portfolio giving a bit allocation to the gold as well apart from equities yes. apart from equities any other asset mm-hmm. allocation that you would suggest no that is i mean so the, the, the uh, investors have to consult their financial advisor as to what is the right uh, asset allocation for them given their risk uh, risk earning stage of the life cycle so there are there are various factors that goes into uh, that con- uh, you know that process right so they have to consult their financial investors how much they should invest across each asset class uh, you know they, they have to be within consultation with financial advisor okay um, so moving to the question from uh... KV Ramani is that uh, the markets have been uh, volatile now. Uh, is it a good time to invest in small and micro cap companies? This is a good time to invest, but as I said, you have to give at least three to five years. It could very well happen that you invest tomorrow, and you know maybe markets could correct further. But you know if you don't need that money for three to five years, you know these are just paper or uh, quotational losses, right? Uh, uh, but you have to give sufficient time. Nobody can predict. Yeah, there could be market to market loss, uh, you know, in your portfolio, but. uh you know if you are coming with 3 to 5 years maybe you know markets will recover when and then you will you will generate good returns with that kind of horizon second question is like if you could answer this like what percent of allocation has been given to the top two sectors and what percent of allocation is given to top two stocks so, uh, in terms of top two stocks the allocation would be around 11% and in terms of top sectors uh, i would say the allocation would be around 45% 45 to 50% Forty-five percent, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, um, like to talk, of course, uh, uh, the topic is revolves around opportunities that we see in the market. So let me put that as a question now. So you know, what are the opportunities that you see currently in the market, which you see it has been quite undervalued now, which can which can uh, you know uh, be seen later in the uh, in this next future. What are the opportunities you see in the market, which you want to get? Into your portfolio, Vedant, you can answer this. Yeah, so uh, so I had uh, this, uh, discussed this earlier also in the call. You had uh, asked a similar question with respect to the opportunities that we look at. So in terms of opportunities, we see that there are a few uh, special situation opportunities that we discussed. There are few opportunities in the lending space which are available with good growth prospects as the uh, country would grow. There would be credit growth as well, and in turn, the lending side would also have good growth. So there are few companies. and pockets there where one can allocate there are few opportunities which are available in the services side as well so one can allocate some funds on the services sector space and also the uh, that we've already discussed is the manufacturing side and how manufacturing currently is just a 17% of the gdp whereas when we see compared with other developed developed countries uh let's say you the us or china or japan then the manufacturing as a percentage of gdp is a very big number it's in its 30s or 40s whereas currently we are just 17% so there's a large sco- long scope that we have there that manufacturing space has to grow further in terms of as a percentage of gdp so we see, see that a lot of growth is expected in that space as well the next question is just to add you know in india has you know vast universe you know uh, the 4000 plus uh, listed companies right and represents a very wide set of industries or sectors so right you would uh, you would always find uh, you know uh, opportunities across sectors as vedan mentioned you will have opportunities in banking uh, banking services manufacturing it's just that you know you have to understand uh, 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 understand those companies and the sectors very well and then you you could you could find opportunities across sectors so it's not just limited to one or two you could find uh, opportunities across diverse set of uh, sectors or businesses and uh, like uh, as for your view as one question from the podium which category investment large cap mid cap small, uh, small cap given growth to uh, growth to us in next two years so rather than categorizing companies based on market cap you know you look for companies which will have good earning growth and are available at reasonable valuation so you could have good opportunity in large cap 
and you can have good opportunity in mid cap and small cap as well right so don't categorize just based on ma- uh, market cap of the company you know market cap of the company just look at the growth prospects and the underlying uh, business or the industries in which it operate and then decide you know what kind of earning growth and versus what kind of valuation they are paying don't just categorize based on market cap it's business to business company to company uh, you know where you see good earning growth and uh, are available at attractive valuations so you have full you could have few large cap stock which could deliver good returns and you could have few mid cap small cap as well uh, deliver good returns so don't just look at from that lens of whether the company is large cap mid mid cap small cap so there are few companies which are you know let's say not in uh, which which doesn't have any representation in large cap companies despite being market leader let's say operates only in mid cap and small cap so you look at the underlying business or the growth prospects of that company and then you invest whether the company is mid, even if that company is a mid cap company right so look at the business underlying business uh opportunities business prospects companies positioning companies balance sheet cash flow and then decide uh, and but does don't, don't just look at the it belongs to large cap mid cap or small cap uh so yeah, as we are in a uh, big bull run now do you any fo- uh, do you foresee any exit time for this bull run sir no i mean see as we have discussed you know india is the, india is the third largest uh you know in every among the top 3 economies uh, you know in like say next 3 to 4 years you know we have favorable demographics the median age is about 27 uh you know very low market share in uh, exports uh, exports of goods and services per capita income of close to 2500 dollars that's an inflection point for consumption world is slowing down we look at us develop uh, europe or china uh, you know macros are very favorable for india right so rather than trying to exit uh bull run or maybe you know if you just stay invested for maybe next uh you know medium to long term 10 20 years and we have seen good returns right from where the market had started in 85 86 from there you know in 24 people have created huge wealth from equities as an asset class right so you know we will still have favorable macros uh, for next uh, you know few decades as well so just stay invested and maybe depending on one's allocation to equities take a call and then just be part of this wealth creation and rather than trying to think where the market is headed tomorrow or one month market will correct let me exit let me enter again it's all futile exercise all those who had stayed invested in markets for 20 30 years they have created wealth so again i will repeat the same thing do that again for next two decades uh, and then you will you'll see significant wealth uh, because this is equity is a compounding right uh, i mean you will see the benefits only uh, once you understand the power of compounding yeah. sure. and let me take the last question for today is that uh, from jay mehta If your benchmark is S and P five hundred and your portfolio composition is more inclined towards micro and small caps, then of course your portfolio will outperform when uh, there's a rally in mid and small uh, small caps. Do, uh, don't you think it is ideal to have a benchmark with more allocation to mid and uh, mid mid small and micro caps? Yes, that is true. But then when we look at the benchmarks which are available. And are approved by SEBI for us to choose. BSE 500 was the closest competitor because we do have allocations to large caps as well. It is not that we don't have allocations. So currently, also 20 around 25 to 30 percent is allocated to large caps. So, so when we have yes, yeah, so sorry, you continue, continue, sorry. Yeah. So when we have that kind of allocation, obviously we 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 need an index which composites all and not just a small cap index would represent the benchmarking for our strategy. So when the market is quite volatile, you see that the because the the uh, amount of positioning in large cap would increase, ideally. Um yes, to, uh, not on volatile times, but when we it all depends. Also depends on the valuations that the markets are currently trading at, and it's obviously not related to market caps as earlier said by Nasser sir. It's more related to the stock, the business, and the valuations that particular stock is available at. So what is the churn? churn ratio of your portfolio so churn ratio for our strategy so it's been less or just one year and one year data is also not yet out so the exact churn rate would be out then but then for our specific strategy you can expect a churn of around 25% on an annual basis okay with that we have come to the end of the session and thank you sir thank you for your valuable time and also for explaining us the strategy and also more about the markets and being more uh, uh, you know optimistic about the markets thank you sir